But today we're talking about the power of surrender. The power of surrender. And um, everybody remembers 9-11. And a person named Janelle McMillan was the last person to be rescued from Ground Zero alive. And she had been trapped in the rubble of what remained of the Twin Towers for 27 hours. Can you imagine being trapped in there all that time? And the last firefighters heard her calling and, and eventually pulled her out after 27 hours in that rubble. And she was a 30-year-old single mother and had only been on the job as a Port Authority clerk for nine months when the terrorist attack happened on September 11th of 2001. And when the North Tower collapsed, her job was no longer on the 64th floor where she was because there was no more 64th floor. And her, her vocation then became, became not to be a clerk but trying to stay alive while she was entombed of ten floors of twisted steel and smoking debris and she was just hoping for a miracle. And later on as she <coughs> excuse me, told reporters she said her head was pinned between two pieces of concrete. It's just unimaginable to be like that for 27 hours. Her legs were sandwiched by pieces of the stairway that she was trying to run down to get out of the building. And her toes had gone numb, she said, many hours before they rescued her. And uh, her right hand was pinned under her leg, and only her left hand was free. She was pinned down by all this rubble. And she, she said she was raised a Roman Catholic in Trinidad and had fallen away from her faith. But in the rubble, her thoughts immediately turned back to God. And she thought about her 14-year-old daughter and she prayed that her body would at least be found so that it could be buried. But she became a bit more, more bold in her prayers and she revised her prayer and asked the Lord that if she had to die that she could at least make it to the hospital so she could see her daughter one more time. But as faith seemed to bubble in her heart, she boldly asked her Heavenly Father to be rescued alive. You see, her faith got stronger and stronger. She said, give me a second chance. I'll promise I'll change my life and do your will. And she says she remembers saying that prayer over and over again. God, please save my life. Give me a second chance. And she had no idea how many times she actually had repeated it or how many hours had passed by, but shortly thereafter she was rescued by the firefighters. The power of prayer. But what do you have to do? You have to surrender first to them, don't you, like she did. So this story illustrates the principle then that it that it's often happens in cases of peril or, or danger. Deep down we all know that there is a crucial issue that we will turn to God because we need to surrender to Him. Because we see that under our circumstances, we can't help ourselves. So we need to surrender to Him and let Him rescue us. You see, she couldn't rescue herself. And to reach a point in life where we fully recognize that we desire more, what we desire more than anything else is for God to be in control of our life. That's what we need to be striving for. And over the last several weeks, we've, we've considered how to live a power-filled life. We've talked about power-filled prayers and, and things like that. And not one of the subjects we touched upon is more important, though, than personal surrender, because without that, we can't have the power of all these things in our life. You see, for starters, there's an initial need for surrender when we first turn over our lives to Christ. He wants us to surrender our will to His will to leave the old world behind and start thinking of things the way he does it, not the way we've been doing it. But unfortunately, part of us wants to keep taking back that old way that we've, we've been used to, the worldly way. And that leaves us with a continual need to surrender to him over and over again. So we're going to start off today by talking about a few things of which surrender is not, what surrender is not. When we say surrender, we don't mean giving up your personality. You don't have to give up your personality to surrender to Christ. And many non-Christians believe that when you become a Christian, God asks you to get rid of whatever makes you who you are. They think that you have to put on a kind of spiritual uniform, right? 
that makes you become just like the other Christians, repeating the same phrases, making all the same gestures, and being an image of other Christians. It would be kind of a boring world then, right, if everybody was exactly the same? Nothing could be further from the truth, though, that God has uniquely made each one of us, and that's why we all have different personalities, we look different, we're different sizes, and so forth, right? Now, God wants us to get rid of our harmful behavior pattern and immoral ways, but He doesn't want us to give up our personalities. He gave us our personalities. And if you were what they call a type A personality before you became a Christian, then you're still a type A after you're a Christian. That didn't change. He didn't change that. We're not a type J personality here now. That means Jesus, right? What else is surrender? It's not losing your ability to think. When we surrender our lives to God, He doesn't ask us, no, I don't want you thinking anymore. I'll do all the thinking for you. No. A lot of people think Christians aren't free to think through issues, to ponder about the universe, to use research, to use their brain to come up with stuff. God gave us those brains so that we could come up with all this stuff. They think Christians are afraid of science, that we're somehow anti-education. No. No, nothing could be further from the truth. If anything, God challenges us to a higher level of thinking and brain power than we've ever used before. And surrender is not becoming spiritually weak. The term surrender is used... To me, surrender your life over to God, not to surrender your spirit and make you just a weakling, simply giving up on everything. The real truth is, when you surrender to God, what happens is you're changed in a way that really builds you into a spiritual champion. Your spirit becomes strong. It means you're able to discern right from wrong, right? Truth from error, what direction to go on. So now that we know what surrender is not, let's talk about what is surrender. Well, surrender, first of all, is not only a necessary part of the salvation process, it's also a necessary part of our lives from the day of salvation and forward. Because until you surrender to God, you can't be what we call saved, right? You can't have everlasting life and be forgiven for your sins. And in Romans 6 and 13, it says, do not let any part of your body become an instrument of evil to serve sin. Instead, give yourselves completely to God. <clears throat> For you are dead, but now you have a new life, so use your whole body as an instrument to do what is right for the glory of God. So let's focus on that phrase, give yourselves completely to God. <clears throat> How do we do that? How do we give ourselves completely to God? Well, by admitting, guess what? That our way isn't the best, but God's way is the best way to go. Now, what could be worse than being trapped behind prison bars? How about to live while avoiding capture? I want to illustrate this whole concept by a story about a prison convict with 10 months to left on his, on his prison sentence, and he would be free. He had 10 months to go. It was for a burglary. He committed a burglary. But he escaped from a Bulgarian prison. After years of freedom, he got away. But after years of freedom, he couldn't really relax. Because why? He was always looking over his head, wasn't he? He was worrying about being caught. It became so stressful, he worked several jobs, moved into an apartment, but was constantly moving around because he was afraid he was going to be caught. So one day, it got so much for him, that worry, he went back to prison and turned himself in after five years after escaping. All this could have been avoided if he just finished out a sentence, right? But the story is an analogy of what many of us have done with God, right? We run away from God. We escape from Him like the lady did in the tower, right? Sometimes for many years. But then there's that nagging reminder on our conscience that we're really not getting away with anything. And even though on the surface we feel like we're living in freedom, we know that we're in bondage. We're in bondage to sin. So we're really not free at all. So to surrender to God 
means that I have come to the conclusion that God knows what's best. Remember the old TV series, Father Knows Best? Well, God is our Father, right? So Father knows best. God knows best what's best for our lives, and that's why we need to turn it over to Him. I'm admitting that I don't have it all together, right? Right? That I don't have all the answers, right? That, I, that I've made wrong choices. So now it's time to let God come in and help me get on the right path. Sometimes I think about, I don't know if anybody lives in Florida has gone down what they call Alligator Alley. It's on Interstate 75 between here and Miami. And there's a long stretch on each side of the highway. It's called Alligator Alley, Alley for a reason. Is the Everglades. And there's these these, this water on both sides, and in the water as you're riding, you can see hundreds of alligators sitting on the banks. And they have fences up all along, and, and there's a dark stretch of highway, and at night people sometimes go off the road. They get sleepy, and the fence, they crash into the fence, and a car is going to be in where those alligators are, and they have alarms on the fence that alert the police, and lights flash where the car went in the water because it's so dangerous. So it's like that in life. You see, we're going down an alligator island, right? And if we're not careful, if we don't stay on that right track, we're in trouble. So we want God to come into our lives to keep us on that road so we don't go in the ditch where the alligators are. And the other thing I like to say about that, when you get to Alligator Alley, just before you get there, you go through a toll booth and you have to pay the toll. So in order to get on that straight road, you've got to pay the toll. Well, guess what? Jesus Christ paid the price for us, didn't he? He paid the toll on our alligator alley of life so that we could go down that straight road without going into ditches. So how else do we live a life of surrender? By choosing to let God control. Let God take the wheel. There's a song out too, an old song, Jesus take the wheel. Jesus take. Let him take the wheel or take control of our lives. You know, if we steer our car, we can steer it any way we want to, right? Follow any map we choose and arrive anywhere we go. But let's suppose we decide to move over to the passenger side and let somebody else make all those decisions. It's still our car, right? And we have the ability to take back control if we want to, but we choose not to do it. And that's what happens when we allow God in our lives. We move over out of the driver's seat and allow Him to take the wheel and take control. We still, it's still our car, we can still tell Him, gee, no, we're not going to follow you no more. Because He lets us do that. He loves us so much, He doesn't force us to do anything. He gives us a choice. Even after we've offered Him control, we're still doing it voluntarily. And at any moment, we can tell Him, no, we want to do our own driving. But when we surrender our lives to God, we're allowing Him to steer for us, to assist us in making the right decision, and giving Him permission to determine the direction of our life. Now, at any moment, we can, we can hold that steering wheel and take over, but every time we do that, what happens? We recognize we made a big mistake, and we need to give it back to God again. That's what happens sometimes in our life. We, we stray away from God. We go down the wrong road. We say, oh, Jesus, you better take the wheel again. What else can we do? <clears throat> we can invite God in to change our hearts. Change my heart, oh God. Every time we turn away from God, we discover that our hearts become hardened against His will. We start doing bad things again. That's right, because the process of surrender needs to take place again if our heart is going to be fashioned after His heart. So we need to pray like the psalmist did in Psalm 51, verse 10. It says, Create in me, Lord, a, O God, a clean heart, a clean heart, and renew a right spirit within me. We're asking God to come in and, and cleanse us, right? Create a new heart and and a, and a right spirit within us. And when we do this, we're, we're getting rid of all that spiritual clutter that keeps us from hearing the Word of God. What happens in our house, right? We have to clean up, we have to sweep our house to prevent the buildup of what? 
dirt, dust, and clutter, right? If you don't, the dust will build up. The dirt on the floor will build up. So what do we need to do with our spiritual houses? We need clean up there too, don't we? We need a spiritual cleanup. So we've seen what surrender is not, and we've seen what surrender is. So what does all this mean for us? If we surrender to God, what does surrender do? Right? We always want to know, what's in it for us? If I do this, what, what am I going to get out of it? Well, it's taken a little while to get here, but it's important that we understand that there are benefits of surrendering to God. We know we should do it simply because He is God, but there's some really side benefits that we don't want to overlook. So what happens? What's the first benefit of surrender? It opens our mind to what I call a new reality. And, and it's not my thoughts, but let's look at the Bible. John chapter 14, verse 21. It says, Those who accept my commandments and obey them are the ones who love me. And because they love me, my Father will love them, Jesus says. And I will love them and reveal myself to each one of them. So obeying God's command is the way that we live a life of surrender. Jesus clearly promises that the people who surrender in this way will be able to receive an understanding about God that's not available to those who disobey. Now some people might come to you and say that they don't feel God's leading or they don't think He's hearing their prayers. What do you say to somebody like that? Say, are you living in obedience to God? You're asking for all these things, but are you living in obedience to Him? Is your life in a state of surrender? Because that's an important part of answered prayer, isn't it? So if we surrender our wills to His will, he will what? Open up our minds to hear and understand Him at a level beyond what we've ever experienced before. Because if we want to follow what He tells us, how do we, we can't just do it. We have to read His Word. And once you read the Word, you have to understand what He's trying to tell us. And that's what He does for us when we surrender to Him. He gives us an understanding. That's why you can read the Bible a thousand times, and each time you read it, you'll get some new knowledge out of it. If you do that with a regular novel, you already know the story, right? But the Bible is an amazing book. It's the Word of God. It's in a living book, really. Because each time you read it, you get a new understanding. All right, what is another benefit of surrender? It causes what I call a, a positive paradigm shift. When we use the word paradigm, we're really talking about a model that we follow. It's a model. And when we're not living lives of surrender, our paradigm is our own model. It's one of our own making. And when we don't surrender, we soon find out what? That we've been living lives that aren't very satisfying. They're in a constant state of dissatisfaction. Spiritual failure at worst. As a matter of fact, John chapter 15 verse 10 says, When you obey my command, you remain in my love, just as I obey my Father's commandments and remain in His love. Now Jesus says, I have told you these things so that you will be filled with my joy. Yes, your joy will overflow. So if we do this, we won't be constantly dissatisfied. We'll have joy, but not only joy, we'll have overflowing joy, the Word says. We can experience joy unknown to us before. Joy that comes from serving God reaches us at a level that allows us to live our lives and begin to experience what I call holy satisfaction. And what else does it do? It empowers us when we surrender. It empowers us for dynamic service. See, God, according to His Word, blesses those who what? Surrender to His will by equipping them for service. Think about it this way. If you're not living a life of surrender, you're really not following God's instruction manual, which is the Bible. <coughs> and what happens when you decide to go on your own way? It's like trying to fix your smartphone, right? These new smartphones. I don't know if anybody... Little kids can probably work them, but it's harder for us folks. 
It's like trying to fix one of these things by following the manual that came with your old dial telephone. Not going to work. They're completely different things. It isn't going to get you anywhere. But when you begin to follow the instructions in the Bible, amen, everything starts falling in place, right? That's when our life starts falling in place. Acts 5 and 32 says, We are witnesses of these things, and so is the Holy Spirit who is given by God to those who obey Him. So, the power of the Holy Spirit comes from who? From God. And who does it go to? The people who obey Him. Only those who follow God's instructions will receive the power and ability to serve God in ministry as well as every other possible way. Everybody has a ministry, not just ministers. Right? Everybody has a ministry in life. Another benefit of surrender is it leads us to God-driven worship. Not just to come in here and sing some songs, but God-driven worship. It's only when we're surrendered to God that we're truly in touch with who He is, what He desires, and why He deserves our worship. Because that put a little more meaning in the songs when you know you're, why we're singing this to Him. He doesn't just want to hear some music. He wants to hear the words from our heart. That's why it doesn't matter whether you sing on key or not. Because we're, not, we're singing because we're worshiping Him because of who He is. Not because He wants to come to a concert and hear some music. No. When we fully surrender to God, the words that we sing, the prayers that we pray, and the scriptures that we read become meaningful. They have a fullness of meaning that is unknown to us before. And when we fully surrender to God, we'll never be bored with worship. Because we're not doing it just because we have to sing a song, no. We're doing it because we want to. We want to let God know how much we love Him. And see, only worship can connect us with God on His level. That's what we call this a praise and worship service. We discover that He's listening literally to the words that we offer up to Him. That He's receiving them gladly. And that he, He's present with us at this very moment. The, the most important part of the message now is that I want to ask you right now to close your eyes and consider the questions I'm about to ask you. Are you right now at this very moment living a life that is fully surrendered to God? Think about that. Are you right now at this very moment willing to turn everything over to God and give Him control of your life? And thirdly, are you right now at this very moment going to quit trying to run your own life and give God a chance for change? And I hope you can answer yes to all of those questions. And if not, why not right now decide to give it all over to Him? Let's pray.